Every year, a quarter of a million children enter foster care across the country. How many children in Hawaii are in the care of foster parents? Would you qualify to raise and care for someone else's child? Have you ever wondered how it all works? And are Hawaii's foster parents getting the support they need? This live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii are next. and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. More than 2,700 children in Hawaii are now in Hawaii's foster care system. These are children whose parents, for whatever reason, are unable to care for them. Placement with a foster family may be for several months. It may be for years until they age out at 18. Over 1,000 resource givers or foster parents in our state give of their time and homes to provide stability for these children. Many have suffered abuse or neglect by the time they're placed in a foster Foster home. A foster parent doesn't have custody, but they are expected to treat the child as they would one of their own regarding food, housing, clothing, and education. The local government or state agency pays most foster parents. For decades, foster parents here in Hawaii received $529 a month per child regardless of age. Then in 2014, those payments increased to $576 to $676 a month depending on the child's age. Tonight's discussion comes in the wake of the state house's shelter of a much anticipated measure that would have increased stipends for foster parents. The action took place in the closing days of the 2017 legislative session. Now due to current litigation, we will not reference this lawsuit tonight or the individuals involved. Instead, we will focus tonight on the challenges as well as the rewards of foster parenting and care. What does it take for a child to be placed in foster care and what are the qualifications to become a foster parent? Are Hawaii's foster parents provided with enough government or outside support to care for the most vulnerable children in our islands. Joining us tonight are guests who are in the forefront of foster care, a foster parent, a representative from the state's Child Welfare Services, a community support services organization, as well as a professional woman who was raised in Hawaii's foster care system. We look forward to your participation in our show. You can email, call, or tweet in your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Francesca Weems was homeless on the streets of Honolulu with her mom and brother before being placed in the foster home system. She's now a senior account executive for Communications Pacific and had a career in sports broadcasting as a sports anchor with Hawaii News Now and Mississippi News Now. James Bott is a resource giver or what was formerly called a foster parent. He has taken in 17 children in 12 years and has adopted five. He currently has nine children under his care and is a legal guardian to a special needs incapacitated adult who's 27 years old. He's also a licensed social worker. Cynthia Goss began working with the Department of Human Services Child Welfare Services branch in 1984 as a social worker. Her career has been dedicated to helping to protect Hawaii's children and supporting their families. She's also helped lead the branch as the assistant branch administrator since 2010. Tina Porras Jones is the vice president of community building programs at Parents and Children Together. She is a social worker with over 20 years of experience in human services. Her expertise is in child abuse and neglect prevention along with intervention. Welcome all of you tonight, you. wonderful people around the table. James, I want to start with you. Um, tell us how about how you became a foster parent and nine children in a home. That's a pretty busy house. It's quite busy. <laughs> um, there's always something going on. It's called, I call it organized chaos. <laughs> Um, I began fostering about 12 years ago. I worked with a young man in a treatment program um, up out in Kahalu, and the program that I worked at, um, I left, and they closed down, and when they closed down, his care coordinator couldn't find a home for him. So she called me, um, she knew I'd worked well with him, and we had a positive relationship, and she said, do you think you could take a call in? So I did, um, and he uh, continues to be under my care as an adult, um, he lives independently now, and he goes to Special Olympics, and he goes to Seiko during the day, during the week, uh, day program, and he has a girlfriend, and he lives an, an everyday life, and he's doing well, and he's very successful, and he visits the family on holidays and weekends and his birthday, and calls me when he wants money, just like all <laughs> other children. <laughs> now, it's one thing to raise a child. Uh, it's quite another to take on that many. What kept you adding to your family? Um, 
usually the calls from CPS, um, and uh, you know I would move from a, to a bigger house so I had more room, um, and it's just been circumstance basically. Um, they, I get a call and they would tell me the needs of the child and what the concerns were. Um, my two six-year-olds, for example, um, they were both in different homes that they were supposed to be adopted. The adoption uh, didn't go through for whatever reason and they needed a home for permanency. Um, so they know that I'll take them and, and take care of them until they age out. Um, so it really kind of just depends on the situation or the circumstance the child's in, what their needs are, and then if I have oh, enough beds, enough bed space. Now, Tina, you're on the front lines of this. Mm -hmm. You might be the agency that's actually starting to make those calls. Tell us about your organization and how it inter interacts with this system. Well, Parents and Children Together have a, a multitude of programs that we partner with. We, we look at it as a partnership with Child Welfare Services to serve uh, foster parents, children in care or custody, and children who may not be, have been taken out of custody, but we're working to prevent them from being put into custody of the state with the family. So our services vary from home visiting to um, our co uh, comprehensive counseling services, which Catholic Charities has the contract and we partner with them, we subcontract with them to provide therapeutic support, individual skill building, just whatever supports the social workers may feel the child may need, we try to go in there and, and make sure we give good services to you know, strengthen and build on their, their family unit because most families are scared, they don't know what's going on, they just want help. So we really look to them as, we're gonna partner with you through this journey and we'll help you get to where you need to be at. Now the goal with working with your organization is to get that child back to their biological parents. Right, for those that are out with foster placement, yes, absolutely correct. Um, Cynthia, I want to go to you. Over 2,000 children in this system right now, are there enough James in the world in Hawaii to handle <laughs> all of those keiki? Never, never enough. And James will tell you, he was called today to um, take four more children to his home. So we are, we are always looking for resource caregivers, primarily on our neighbor islands where we are more in need of them. We always look to place children with people they know. So relative placement is our priority or kinship placements. And when we don't have that, we place with non-relative. It's always traumatic for a child to be removed. So when you remove a child, the best thing for the child is with relative or, or kinship placements. And if they're siblings, you want them together. Yeah. yeah, we have a huge need for uh, teenagers. Mm -hmm. Teenagers can be quite difficult. A lot of people don't want to take in teenagers. We have a huge need for large sibling groups. Um, oftentimes you've got five, seven, eight siblings, large groups, and so you have to have a big house and a lot of bedrooms to be able to take that large of a group in. Um, so there's, there's always a need for those specialty children that have, might have special, special needs or um, big, larger needs than, than one or two children. So even are. if you have, like James says, if you have a large group, a sibling group, more often than not, the older ones are looking out after their younger ones. So when you separate them, it creates, uh, it, the kids get anxious and they worry about where their siblings are. So if you can get them split up, but in a relative homes that, that they can see each other, that's ideal if you can't get them all together. Mm -hmm. And how big are we talking about? Well, sibling groups of five and six yeah. and seven. They're one big. of my kids comes from nine. Uh, some of my kids come from four. Uh, one of my kids comes from 10. Well, the one that we, we called you about today is- There's six, yeah. but they're in three different homes. I have the baby, there's two girls in one home and there's three children that were in a grandparent's home. It didn't work out um, because their needs are just uh, too much for the grandparents to handle. And so they're, that's why they call me, because you know, I can handle the, their needs, but I just don't have the bed space. Francesca, I want to bring you in on this. Um, it was you and your brother. Tell us about your experience. Were you able to stay together? And I know you went through a multitude of homes before landing in a permanent situation. Absolutely. So we actually were not able to stay together. We, we, got, we had an opportunity to live together for about um, two placements. 
and then we were separated for the latter half of my term in foster care. So I entered foster care at eight and a half. My mother has schizophrenia, so she has a mental illness, and she wasn't able to take care of us, uh, but that's long-term placement. Um, we were in and out of homes, about 20 of them on, the, on Oahu and some of the other neighbor islands like Kauai and Maui before we were permanently placed with different families. So o overall, probably about 20 different homes. I was in six long-term homes. The final one, I was placed at 14 with a wonderful woman named Jackie. But unfortunately, again, um, our house was split. And so I think it's important to keep kids together. I often uh, wish that my brother and I had grown up, especially on the latter half of our lives, um, in the same house, because I wonder how it would have impacted our relationship today. Um, so I, I love that they're speaking to, trying to keep them together. And if you, uh, as she was saying, um, if not, at least keep them in the same vicinity. We're definitely blessed to live about 10 minutes apart, so we weren't far, but it's still a world of difference to grow up in a house even 10 minutes apart because we had different lives, right? So um, it's really important, I think, to, again, to keep kids together. 20 different placements, yes. why so many? The initial part, um, before the long placement, I just think that maybe they were trying to keep us together with our mother. They wanted to have her be the caregiver. Unfortunately, with somebody with a mental illness, especially the severity of her schizophrenia, it just wasn't possible. So I believe probably on this island, and again, Maui and, and uh, Kauai, uh, the social workers probably were just trying to figure out can, can this woman take care of her kids and then when I entered when we landed on the big island those particular social workers were just like you know this woman cannot um, take care of these babies we're, we were homeless um, sleeping on the streets in and out of different homes in and out of um, you know hotel rooms sleeping outside of libraries uh, it's not safe for kids and so um, the, the neighbor islands and particularly the big island they got it those social workers understood and we were permanently taken away obviously my brother and I were devastated at the time but I think I can speak for myself when, you, when we look back we're happy because we got opportunity we were clothed we were fed we got an opportunity to go to school neither of us were in um, school at the time at eight and a half I couldn't read or write I was severely behind um, and those statistics show that somebody from that particular background shouldn't go on to college which we were both able to do so it's important that kids are caught earlier uh, but in our case we're definitely blessed to have the resources on the Big Island to catch up to our classmates and then go on to college and both of us have our masters so we're a very rare subset but it can be done Wow, it yeah. sounds like the system didn't work for you initially, and then it did. It, and then it did, absolutely. Wow. Um, Cynthia, when you hear a story like Francesca's, it has to make you feel good that ultimately it did result, you know, her and her brother both achieving master's degrees. Yeah. That's, that's very, it's very good to hear. And I'm glad to hear that it was Kona that um, rose up there and said to, these kids can't go back home to their mother. So our mission is to always, is to protect children from, harm in the, from their parents. We also look to not always remove right away, to try to put services in to keep the kids at home safely. Keep the kids home safe. When that cannot happen, it's then is to put them in foster care with people that they know, which is relatives, and then put services in to try to reunify the kids with their parents. We, we, we have been criticized for, you know, trying too long to reunify kids with their parents. And we do have assessment tools, and we do have, um, we can always do things better. And when you look back at what we did, we can see where we may have, could do things differently. We always looked, I always believe that we have staff who do what's best for the family. And we're very, we're criticized a lot. It's a tough job to be in, um, the outcomes that we see, and the, we're, what we can see and do for our families is gratifying. Um, there are times when it's tough to be in a worker in this field and we it, people don't always understand the decisions we make and because of the privacy and confidentiality that's there that governs our work we cannot speak out about what we did and why so it is tough but when francesca speaks about what she went through it is it's, it's gratifying yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean that has to be an incredibly difficult determination to decide that okay this child cannot be reunited with their family what is that breaking point what do you mean? I mean, at what point do you decide, you know, in Francesca's case, she was saying it was in and out, you know, 20 different homes. Is it, is it a time frame? Is, it, is there a particular threshold that the parent can't meet? That well, they... yes. So we, we work aggressively for like a nine-month period to keep, to see what we can do. Um, substance abuse and mental illness. When parents turn the corner and are drug-free or when they're taking their medication and going through therapy, we want to give that, give that opportunity. 
to have the kids go back home. And then when they relapse or stop taking their medication, the kids may come back into care. We still work the case. We don't say automatically we can't. If the parent shows interest in trying to make it right, we try to do that. At some point, maybe it's nine months, 12 months, we're gonna to have to move towards permanency. So when we have kids in care, or even when we have a family working with us, we do concurrent planning. So we're trying to look at two tracks at the same time. You know, work towards keeping the kids home, and if we can't do that, what's plan B? Because we can't look at plan B when the kids are already, when it's the house is in disarray. We're trying to make a plan that's gonna work for the kids. If the kids can't stay home, this is a plan here. An example of that is when we have children who are in foster care, we're working with the family, but plan B has to be, if there's relatives on the mainland, not here, we're, start, we're starting to ask the mainland to start looking at these relatives for a possible placement if plan A doesn't happen. We don't wait until the kids are now in foster care, they have no one to go to, to make a request that's gonna take about three to four months, maybe six months for a mainland agency state to give a feedback about a home in, on the mainland. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Now, James, you ended up adopting a number of these children. You become the plan B. Tell us about that decision and how that works. Uh, like I said, everything, every child is different. So one of my children that I adopted, uh, I got him at eight. I, the adoption didn't go through until he was 12. So the plan was to re reunite with mother. Um, sister was in foster care, but they only gave me the boy and the sister stayed in a different home. Sister went back home, but mother's husband at the time didn't want the, my boy back. So that was an unusual situation. Um, so he stayed with me and the longer he stayed with me, he started doing well and um, mother stayed with the guy so she, that he couldn't go back home. Um, and then by the time mother finally left the guy, uh, he had been with me so long and he was doing so well, we de I decided, and mother and I decided together that I would adopt him, but his mother's been in his life the whole time. So he had a relation, he had me as his family, my family as his family, but he still had a relation with his mom. So that was a unique situation. Um, sometimes they come and they've already terminated parental rights. They have no relationship with the parents for whatever reason. Um, I have a seven or 19 year old who came to me at 17 and he wanted to be adopted because he had a poor relationship with his uh, family who adopted him when he was a baby and they gave him up at 15. They had him his whole life. Um, another unique situation. At 17, he wanted to be adopted by me. He wanted to belong to my family and that was totally his choice at 17, right? And so we did the adoption in four months. It was a very quick process. So every situation's been very unique with my children. I have another boy, he was in eight homes in four months. When he came to me, he was quite difficult. A lot of in-home therapists from agencies like PACT, um, skills trainers working with him, a lot of work at school. Um, now he's on the football team at Roosevelt, he's getting A's and B's. He's one of my success stories, and he was adopted because parental rights were terminated a long time ago. Um, and all his siblings were adopted by other families, they just didn't want him because of his behavior problems. But now he's doing very well. So each of my children have these unique uh, experiences. So I have two six-year-olds, one of them, parental rights were already terminated, he's ready for adoption. The other rights, the other one, we're still going through the court process. Um, mother's still having time to work on her service plan. Um, so we don't know what the outcome's gonna be on his case. And my, I have a 20-month-old, um, and his mother, they're hoping the mother goes through drug treatment, gets her life together, follows her service plan, and can get him back. But that's all unknown, because the recidivism rate with drug and alcoholism is very high. People relapse often. Yeah. Usually if there's mental illness plus drug addiction, um, it can be quite difficult. So sometimes it's kind of a roller coaster, it's a ride, and DHS is trying to do the right thing by reunif always focusing on reunification and working with the families, and then sometimes they um, exhaust that option and then it becomes, okay, do you wanna keep them? Will you keep them? And then families are given that option, and I've always been of the mind, you know, um, I'm, not, I'm not replacing the father, I'm just another father. So I never um, make my children call me dad. I tell them you call me James or uncle or whatever. And so I, half my kids call me James and half of them call me dad. And that's fine because sometimes dad doesn't mean good things to a child. Yeah. 
so I don't ever force that on a kid. So, and in my house, they get to be who they want, whatever they are, and um, and it's not a violent home, so we don't allow hitting and all that. And so the children, a lot of times, the children decide they want to stay with me or they don't. So um, it's really a lot of it's uh, working with the department, working with the families. I work with bio families, bio siblings. I'm a very flexible person, so I want to do what's best for the children and um, offer them whatever that they need. So my, all my teenagers are in contact with their biological parents. Um, and then some of the parents I have relationships with. I have fathers that are like, no, I want them to stay with you. You're doing a great job with my children. Thank you. They thank me for taking care of their children. So that's all very positive and, and rewarding. And I'm providing that place for the children to have a stable upbringing. And then they hopefully will do as well as Francesca. She is a, quite a success story. And we want more of our foster children to go to college and do well like she's doing. You know, Tina, listening to James, you know, I mean, what an exemplary heart, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you, if someone's watching this and they think, okay, maybe I could do that, um, maybe not nine, maybe just one, um, <laughs> what, what makes a good foster parent? You know, uh, I really think be, having a good heart and having that, that empathy, I think for us is working in this field, it's all about our passion and our passion to keep children safe and healthy. And I think if they have that passion, regardless if they live in a big fancy house or if they live in a two-bedroom apartment, you know, they should seek it out and see, see what the requirements are and, and see what it's all about. Go to a class that the DHS offers you know, and, ch and check it out because these children, there's a lot of children, as you know, that need these safe homes. Um, we have the callers weighing in tonight, and we love hearing from you, so please do call, text, tweet us your questions. Um, anonymous writing in, what background checking does the state do on foster parents, both before and during their role as foster parents? Cynthia, I wonder if you could take this one. So we do, when you be, um, apply to become a resource caregiver or a foster parent, that is what was called before, we do background checks on all adults that live in the home. So that's a, a child abuse and neglect clearance and a criminal clearance and that is done at, at the outset and then it's also done throughout the licensing when you're licensed as a resource caregiver you go through another check every year. There's uh, a fingerprinting. Um, there's two agencies in Hawaii that um, foster, are licensed foster families. So Catholic Charities does relative placement so if a child, a relative is gets a child that's related to them, they go through Catholic Charities. And if it's anybody out there that wants to be a foster parent, they go through Hui Ho Malu. Uh, and they, uh, they have a whole process. So you, I used to work for them, so that's why I know. <laughs> <coughs> um, they go through the, the criminal clearance, they do fingerprinting. Any adult in the home has to go through the same process. So even if you have roommates or boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever the relationships are, everybody goes through that process in the home, all adults. Um, you have to list all the parents. You go through a home study, which is an extensive 30-page questionnaire. Um, every question you can imagine about you, your family, your birth family, your parents, their parents' relationship, they, you have to answer all these questions with a, so, uh, a social worker. Uh, they come to your home and they look through your home and make sure that you have the beds and the dressers and no guns and knives are put away and your uh, flammable and combustible things are kept and locked place and those kinds of things, make sure it's a safe environment. So it's a one to two month process to go through it all. You have to give a driver's abstract and driver's license and uh, you, there's a lot of forms that you have to turn in. So it is a lengthy process, um, but it's not hard or difficult. They, the people at these agencies help you through it, walk you through it, tell you what you need. So it's not hard, it's just a lengthy, complex process. And then you can you go to training. And then after, there's also a uh, there's a nine hour training on CDs that you watch at home and nine hour in class training. And it's um, people that have, that either work in the system or have been foster parents. I used to do training for them also. So that's why I know. <laughs> You're very well versed on yeah. this topic. <laughs> Francesca, being on the other side of that, having as much interaction with so many different kinds of foster families, what do you think as, as a child coming in, what makes a good foster parent? It starts with love, right? It just, it starts with the compassion to change somebody else's life. Um, and then obviously the training and the background checks and everything else come into play, but it's, it really starts with the foundation of just wanting to make a difference. And there needs to be more Jackies like my foster mother and, and James in the world, people that are willing to take risks, take kids that are 
hard to place, maybe older, um, to, to make that change in their life so that they don't end up a statistic that two out of 10 make it, so that they don't end up homeless, so they don't end up you know, incarcerated, so they don't end up uneducated, um, because only about 3% have a bachelor's degree and about 0.5 have a master's. So it's a trend that we need to change and it starts with good parenting. But the first onset is having that compassion to just start the process. And then, I, like I said, the rest of it comes into play, but that's the foundation. Um, what I will say is that not everybody is equipped or should be foster parents. There's all different types of ways that you can get involved to help foster kids. I tell people that you know, if you have a banking background or you're an accountant, you can help and reach out and help foster kids learn how to balance a checkbook. If you're into sports like I was, you can maybe put together a sports team. If you are a dancer or into art, you can help them become artists and fulfill their dreams and become a mentor. So there are other ways to impact foster kids outside of just foster care, but we absolutely need good parents that are going to be there, they're going to treat you like their own, and I think that's what separates the James and the Jackies from the world from other parents as well, because when she took me on as her child, the, from the moment I stepped in her house, it wasn't Francesca the foster child, it was Francesca my daughter. She didn't birth me, but she never separated me from her twin daughters who she birthed. So that's important to make that yes. distinction that you don't separate. Absolutely. We've already gone through so much going up, um, you know, that we were by ourselves, like, you know, when we're in school we feel alienated because maybe we don't have the latest gear. We come from such tough backgrounds that to have a parent then separate you in the house and make you feel as other when you already feel like other on the outside, it's just detrimental. So I commend parents that can take that on, even though they didn't birth you, for you to come in and make you feel like you're one of theirs. When you were placed yes. into Jackie's home, did you know that that was going to be an adoptive situation or was that another stop along the road that then became permanent? Right, so actually she didn't adopt me formally. She just became a permanent placement. And part of the reason is not because she didn't want to adopt me. She absolutely did. We decided not to go through with adoption for financial reasons for college. It's just easier when we're applying for tuition grants and other stuff to go under the umbrella as a foster child. So I just want to make that clear. She loves me to death and totally <laughs> wanted to adopt me. But it, again, for financial reasons, it just made sense for me to go in as a foster kid. But um, what I saw in her that, again, I didn't see in some other foster homes is that they did separate me. Almost all the other homes I went to, it was, oh, this is my foster daughter, Francesca. And on the onset, it seems really harmless because it's like, you know, you know I, I'm with like Hawaiian parents or Caucasian parents. Clearly, I'm not their biological daughter. But for them to, in, you know, continue to reference that, it made me feel like other. And so until I got in Jackie's home, that's when I felt like I could flourish. I felt like I could do anything that my heart desired. I could dream big. I could go to Stanford. I could go to Berkeley. I could go play sports. I could be on air if I wanted to be. Um, and she gave me that backing that I didn't feel other foster parents had, particularly because it, at the, on the onset, it started with, this is my daughter. Just simple words. I called her mom. I still call her mom. But it, it, it was so important for her not to differentiate me from her own. That's so interesting, Absolutely. Tina, the, this whole idea that language plays mm -hmm. such a difference for the children. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. And, and I believe, you know, going back to what Cynthia shared earlier, too, it's not, and, and also Francesca, it's not just the department's responsibility to, to have our children safe and healthy. It's, our, it's the community's responsibility. And we as service providers, we have to partner with folks and, and ask the families, what are their needs? What, how can we help? You know, and, and even think outside of the box because a lot of times with bureaucracy and the, you know rules and legislation, we have to think outside of the box. How can we provide services to families and just be there for the kids? And really, that's that's the approach that we we take with other community providers and partners also. Well, let's talk about the need. We have some slides that we want to put up here just to look at the numbers. Um, we are looking first statewide, if you can look here. This is children in foster care by county, the 2015, 2016. And then, of course, we're not <clears throat> finished with 2017, so those are just the numbers for, the ha for half of the year. Um, what's striking about these numbers um, is when you look at the Big Island, it seems like there's quite a bit of need. Cynthia, island by island, um, how are we looking this year as it compared to others? So as you can see, for ju up until July 2017, um, children in foster care by county, of course, Honolulu has, the, has a lot, and Hawaii County has a lot. And what's tricky about Hawaii County, it's, it's a, it is called the Big Island for, for the right reason. Right. So 
yeah. the ge geographic area is large, and we have two offices that cover a large around a large area. And services is there's not a lot of services. There's not, we could use more services there in terms of resource caregivers, in terms of drug treatment, domestic violence, parenting, and so that the numbers are reflective of our need for services to support the growing number of kids in foster care. Now, if you have um, too many kids on one island, do you try to give, turn, you know, like in Francesca's case, she went from Oahu to the big island. Um, you know, you, I would assume that you try to keep them on their home island. Right, because you want, while we're working towards reunification, we want the children to still see their parents. So that does, that's tricky. Um, sometimes we do have, well, we see more and more kids on one island and their parents are on another island because the parents are receiving treatment on another island. So if it's a residential drug treatment, oftentimes they're here on this island, but the kids are, their home island may be Maui or Kauai. So we do send the parent or the kids over to see their parents. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to some other slides we have. Um, we want to continue down the list if we could. Sorry about that. Um, these are the homes that are licensed. So this is the other side of that equation. First we showed you the need, now we're looking at the homes. So can you tell us about these different um, categories? We have general, special, special relative, emergency shelter, adoptive. What, what are those different designations? So um, the general license would be like a James. Um, so he, um, uh, I can take in any children. Right. And he, so he doesn't have relative placement kids. Mm -hmm. If he was, then he'd be a, a special relative home. So that's like a grandma or an auntie or what have you. What is, what is special? What does that mean? Is that, someone with spe is that for children with special needs? Or? No, it's a special relative. I'm not sure what special relative is from special. Do you, James? <laughs> Um, unless that's more like medically fragile kind or something. Oh, I see, okay. That might be more specialized, where the children need really specialized care. I see, We okay. have some of those children mm -hmm. also. So this is 2016, the next slide is 2017, um, and the one after that is actually the one I wanna get to, if we could. Um, and this is children exiting foster care, the reason that they've left. Um, it, can you tell us about these different these different categories as well? So in 2016, it says we have 160 children that were, um, re they left foster care for adoption. That's great. And 66 were emancipated out, meaning they were not adopted. So, so like some of James's kids emancipated out and our guardianship is 100. And 600, 676 for reunification, that's good too. What do we want uh, with these? Is reunification the ultimate goal? It is. It's, that's our national standard for us to do is to reunify. Um, and we, Hawaii actually, um, the numbers in Hawaii are pretty high and yeah. we top a lot of the mainland states as far as reunification. We're actually recognized for that because mm -hmm. we do a, such a good job of it here. Um, and with the adoption, how at, at, who makes that determination? Is that something that the foster parent then stands up and says, I want to do that, or is that something that the state would ask the, the foster parent to do? How do you determine with the, with, when a foster parent actually becomes an adoptive parent? So we have, a, we have those discussions with the resource caregivers about permanency for a child. Um, we, we, we ask that up front in our studying of them as a resource caregiver, you know, what is their, they may come in and say, we wanna just be a resource home. We have no interest in being a permanent home. Um, and that's fine, because we are not an adoption agency. We are not here to bring kids into foster care to have them adopted by somebody, uh, by a non-relative, to be taken off island to another state. We are, our goal is to return children to their parents, and if not that, it's to relative or kinship placement. Okay. Um, James, I know that there's some li uh, litigation with the compensation level, so I don't want to dive too deep, but I think some people will be wondering, uh, is this your full-time job? Uh, you can't possibly be doing a regular job and be raising nine kids. No, I, I, I work for the Department of Education. I'm a school social worker. Wow, and you're raising nine yes. children at the same time. Um, you've been doing this for quite a long time. Yes. Tell us, is the compensation enough, given no. the need? No. So how do you, I how do you do can it? honestly tell you it is not enough. I uh, my credit cards are all maxed all the time. Um, I never have enough money. Um, you know, I, I I survive and I make it, but you know the rents are very high here. I don't own a home, so I, I, I have a I'm lucky that I have a fellow school teacher that lets me live in her parents' house that she was raised in. 
Um, so I was lucky to find it, and I have a home in Manoa, so I'm very lucky. Um, but no, I, it's not enough, and uh, I could always use more. Um, and it's quite expensive raising kids and providing, you know, my kids want the same thing as every other kid. They want the top, the top electronics, the newest phone. They all want an iPhone. I'm like, why do you need an iPhone? They have to have an iPhone. <laughs> well, I, have teenage, I have five teenagers. They all want the same thing as all their friends at school. So, you know, it's never enough. And all, any parent will tell you, you never have enough money to raise your kids. So, because they always want more and more and more. And my kids, I want to provide for them everything that they didn't have. You know, I have kids that never went to the movies. First time I took them to the movies was the first time they went to the movies. They never went to the water park. Um, I've taken kids on vacation on airplanes. They've never been on an airplane. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I relish that I can uh, op give them opportunities that they've never had and provide for them experiences that they never had. I try to go out to eat with them and teach them how to eat in a restaurant and how to function in the community. That's very important to me. I try to raise good citizens. That's very important to me because um, I want them to contribute to the community when they leave my home. Wow, Tina, when you hear that, I mean, mm -hmm. credit card's all maxed out. He's working full-time and raising nine kids. What kind of support, other than the, the 576 to $676, mm -hmm. do these parents get um, medical, therapeutic coverage? What, what else do they get that can help them when raising this child financially? I will defer that question to <laughs> Cynthia <laughs> because I'm just one of the many service providers. Well, I, I can tell you everything that we can. You go ahead. <laughs> uh, um, for, for, the, for the difficult kids, there is what's called difficulty of care. So when your child has needs above and beyond the average child, which probably most of our children do in foster care because of what the, they've experienced in their life, um, there is more money. that You get a little bit more money. Um, we get clothing reimbursements up to $600 a year, so that's usually 300 twice a year. Um, we can get reimbursements for special activities, for sporting events, for hula, for dance class, things like that. Um, right now I'm trying to get reimbursements for braces. I have four kids that need braces at $6,000 a piece, so I'm asking the department to help me with that. Um, of course, they don't have the money for it, but we're going to work together to try to find it. So um, there are reimbursements for their activities, for when they go to prom or a dance, you, just, you can get reimbursed for the tux and the dance tickets. And if they have banquets at school, I can get reimbursed for those kinds it's of things. It's called bids, not dance tickets. Oh, sorry, bids, but <laughs> in my day it was dance. And their medical is covered by and Quest. And they all, all the kids come with Quest. But something like braces is considered. Braces is not covered by Quest. Mm -hmm. See. Um, we have uh, some people writing in tonight. What type of support is offered to foster children who are struggling with drug and alcohol issues? Are there special foster homes for the more challenging situations? Tina, do you want to take that? Um, I actually, we, we don't do foster homes, so I think maybe James or something. <laughs> yeah, child, child and Family Service and Holly Kipa yeah. have therapeutic foster mm -hmm. homes, so they would work with those kind of kids. We have a Bobby Benson Center in uh, Kahuku that works with our t teenagers with uh, drug and alcohol problems. Uh, we have Merimed for boys, which is uh, kind of a ship. Has, they have ships and sailboats that they take the kids on. Um, so I've had a kid that went through both of those programs because he has a drug problem. Unfortunately, that didn't help him, and he still has a drug problem. But um, so, and then a lot of our kids go through therapists, have their in-home therapy, uh, out-of-the-home therapy, you know, office therapy. Yes, Hinamauka um, has a good team. Oh, Hinamauka has a program. And that's program. covered, but those therapies, those are not those are all covered. out of pocket no, for you. No, that's all covered under Quest. Covered. Mm -hmm. Quest covers all that. No. I have a child with mental health, severe mm -hmm. mental health needs. And so she's been at Queen, she's been at Kai Mohala. Uh, right now she's in a therapeutic foster home. I'm hoping she comes home by Christmas. But she's had, so she spent a year outside my home right now because of her extensive mental health needs are beyond my abilities. Wow. Um, Cynthia, when someone is hearing this, they might think like, well, I can't take that on. I can't necessarily foster for, you know, for a long time. What is the commitment that uh, someone needs to make if they wanted to take in a child temporarily? What is the commitment? You know, I mean, you're, are you asking, because I know you eventually want to place them within nine months. Is that correct? We want to, yes, we're going to look at returning the child home. So what we're looking for is, it, what James, James is exceptional, as is, Francesca. So we would like all our homes to be like James and we would like all our outcomes to be like Francesca. So somewhere in the middle is a home that will take a child and be loving and accepting of the child where the child came from. 
and work with us, partner with us to maintain the child's connection with the siblings and with the parents. By that I mean is to help us with our transportation to get the child to and from the visits, to get the child to and from any type of counseling or therapy that they might need, and help support our goal to reunify. And if they are not able to do that within the six, nine, or maybe 12 months, is to help us support the child's permanent placement with another person, another family. Amy from the Windward side is writing in tonight, and this is a question for Cynthia. She says, the reunification numbers seem pretty high. Does this mean the parent was able to successfully complete the services to be able to get their children back? What is the process for reunification? So we have, um, so a lot of our cases end up in family court. So we have the judicial oversight with us to support the parents working towards a service plan. And in the service plan, <clears throat> we outline the services they need to address what brought them to us, involved with us. And there is a guardian ad litem that represents the children's best interests. There's the parents have attorneys. And parents have to complete services to establish and maintain a safe family home for the children. So some of the services that they might have to complete would be parenting classes, drug and alcohol treatment, um, finding a place to live, finding a job, you know, creating that stability that the children need, um, showing the department that they are stable, they're making good choices, and they're able to provide that safe home. So those are all outlined in a service plan that their parent is given time. Now, the judges are overseeing it, and so sometimes DHS might want to say, you know, it's been a year already, but the judge might say, we're going to give you another six months. So sometimes these cases do go on for a while because the judges will give the parents more time to complete the service plan. Parents sometimes fall off the wagon, get back on, you know, try again, and so they get more time to. And that's why some of our, some of my kids have stayed longer yeah. before it was like, okay, enough already. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna finish this and we're gonna terminate parental rights and we're gonna move the case to permanency. So it really does vary by case. You know, Francesca, in your case, I know you said you've had six long-term placements. Yes. Um, in between each of those, were you reunited and then taken out, or were you just going home to home? From house to house. So only during the, the tumultuous, more, more so like 14 houses before the permanent placements, was it about two weeks here, you know, an incident would happen, my mom might get arrested, and then we'd be put in for about another like three weeks, and then we'd go back to her. But the long-term placements were all back to back to back to back. Yes, and absolutely. And why were you moved back to back to back? For various reasons. A lot of them just weren't good fits. Um, I think part may be that maybe they weren't ready to be foster parents, and it was a lot, and I was dealing with a tremendous amount given that I came from homelessness and a, a, a parental background with somebody with mental illness, right? So I had a lot of baggage. I acted out. I'm a completely different person uh, <laughs> now than I was in these particular homes. So I've actually seen a lot of my former foster parents, and they have acknowledged that it's a tremendous amount of growth I've, they, they've seen in me, but it takes that right person. So there's no hard feelings that it didn't work out, but for, yeah, a lot of it just wasn't good placements. They, they thought I was too much to handle, perhaps. They weren't trained properly to take on somebody with uh, with my particular background and just for various reasons they didn't work out um, but you know it, it's tough it's tough um, when those particular families didn't work out because it, it felt like a rejection every time your your stuff is thrown into a trash bag mm -hmm. uh, the CPS worker comes and picks you up and drops you at the next the next house within an hour and you're sitting there meeting a new family it's like a new introduction hi I'm Francesca um, this is some about my background they obviously have a file on me but I felt like it was an interview process and that I wasn't sure if they would ever really love me so ultimately I would put families through the ringer unfortunately to see if they would ultimately be the ones who were gonna stick it out with me so Every family I went to, I would test them. I would do things just, you know, as a child, just to see if you really love me. Would you treat me like your own child? It's not, it didn't do anything that was, I would say, like tremendously outrageous, but I would just test them in little ways. Are you gonna love me the same way if your child did this? Uh, you wouldn't abandon them, so are you gonna abandon me? And the only one that passed the test was Jackie. So, um, <laughs> and I'm glad she did because she's turned out to be wonderful, but uh, it, it was funny that the conversation she's so well trained and she has a background on social media or, or sorry social work um, 
that she knew what I was doing and she actually called me out and that's when I broke down and that's the end of uh, my trials with her. She was like, I know what you're doing. I know you're testing me. I'm not new to this um, and I'm not gonna let you win. I'm here for life and I love you and you are my daughter but if you wanna carry on on this little game you're playing, have at it and I think that's when everything came off, so. That's a tremendous story. Yeah. What about your brother? You said he was 10 minutes down the road. 10 minutes did down he the road. Found, did he find his Jackie, so um, to speak? I don't think he found his Jackie, but he ended up luckily okay. I think even though we ended up in different homes, thank goodness um, our biological mom, she's highly educated, even though she had a mental illness, she really emphasized school and education, and we had sports to lean on. And so that's ultimately another facet that carried us through. But no, he did not end up with a home like Jackie, and he unfortunately does not have a relationship in the same capacity that I do with Jackie, who is a mother to me. So he, there is no other mother outside of our biological mother that he considers in that capacity. But um, in the end, he did make out okay. He went to U UH, he played on the football team, and now he's a captain in the um, Army. So and he has a master's, so he's doing well um, despite. Yeah. And, and he was 10 minutes away. Were you able to see yes. each other? Yes, yeah, so we got to see each other. We had a lot of coordinated visits. And then in high school, uh, he was a senior and I was a freshman, so I saw him at lunch. We just <laughs> sit and eat lunch together. And then um, he's a, he was a track prodigy. I followed in his footsteps, so we're on the track and cross-country teams together. So I got to see him in extracurricular activities. We ate lunch a lot at school. I would see him in the hallways. But it was a little interesting dynamic to like have your brother in school, but you don't live with him, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And it was yeah. tough to explain to people because mm -hmm. um, when we get dropped mm -hmm. off, off, some of my um, teammates or classmates would ask, like, oh, wait, so is, does, you know, does your brother not live with you? I'm like, no, unfortunately, we live in different homes. So that's always tough. And again, when you're not in that house and you're not bonding, you're not gelling, it has long-term effects um, on kids as they become adults. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Someone writes in tonight what I think we're all thinking. James is a saint. Thank you for caring. Can you, James, talk about what's become of the children who have aged out of your home? Um. <clears throat> Well, some of them have gone back to, like I said, to their family. So my one boy is living with his mom right now. The other boy, I don't know. He, I know he was homeless, so I don't know where his whereabouts. I haven't seen him in two years. Um, that didn't end very positively. So, um, And then the other boy still lives with me. I've had some kids return to their families, and so I do still keep in contact with some of my the families where the children returned. I had two little boys that are... I think they're in fourth grade now, and I got them when they were in kindergarten. And I, I keep in contact with their family on, on social media. Um, there's another boy that I'm friends with his mom on social media, and so I keep pictures of him, and I know how he's doing. So in some ways, I keep track. And then another boy that left my home, he was quite difficult, but I still talk to his social worker and ask how he's doing, and so I keep in touch with them that way. When these children are coming in your homes, especially you said you had a 20-month-old right now, it must be terribly difficult not to get too attached because you know at some point you may have to give the child back. How do you balance that emotionally? Well, I attach to all of the children I take in, and I love them all, so it is quite difficult, and I get brokenhearted all the time, but um, I, I know in my heart I'm doing the right thing, and it's best for them. It must and also be tough on the whole family unit because yeah. the other children must bond with these children and then one is taken out or a new one comes in. I mean, how do you deal with that? Um, well, sometimes they don't mind when they leave. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the relationship. Um, and then sometimes, yes, they do ask about them and they do talk about them and we do have conversations about that uh, with all the kids. My house is pretty open, we do talk a lot. So we talk about those things and feelings. And my kids all go to therapy and they all have a therapist. So and we do family sessions together, so there's a lot of communication. Uh, there's a funding question. Now, how much of your funding is federal? What is the discussion in Washington, D.C. of any possible funding cuts for you? So we're still waiting to see what's going to happen with our federal funds. It's in the millions, and at this point we are um, being very fiscally responsible, more so with our spending, because if the if the Congress cuts our budget, which is a, a lot of it is federal. I'm not sure what percent. I do know that um, a lot of our services will be impacted, so we're going to have to use state funds to shore up that part of it. Yeah, we're talking Medicaid and Quest. What, what, I mean, at, at some point, does the state then just have to step in? I mean, how is this going to be handled? I would think so. I'm not sure. I, I leave that to my boss to tell us um, how much money we have and we have good people trying to figure it out, but we're all waiting to see. So right now, a lot of our spending is on hold. We don't, we, we, we're not, for our children, our foster kids, we still spend as we have always. We have kids that 
traveled on vacation with their resource caregivers. So the resource caregivers will pay for their own tickets, but they want to take the foster kids with them, and I think that's great because you don't, like Francesca says, you don't want a resource caregiver to say, okay, we're going to take our own birth kids to Disneyland, so these foster kids have to go somewhere else while we travel. If they're going to take them, we will pay for these kids to go. And we have more of that happening, so that's a good thing. So that kind of spending continues. It's whether we go to a conference, whether we're going to fly to the neighbor islands to do our meetings, whatnot, we have to cut back on that. Mm -hmm. um, if anyone's watching tonight and they think that this might be something that they want to delve into, what's the first step? I think the first step is to uh, talk it over with your family, you know, because it's, it's really going to affect your family life. And everybody has to have that compassion and that feel to really want to make that change in that child's life and be there for that child. You may not know what to do or what to say, but the fact that you're there and you're compassionate and you're trying to understand where they're at, where they're coming from, is probably the best gift you could give to them. So really talk it over as a family unit and then see if your family's interested in, in taking in the child and bringing them to a part of your family, like Francesca said. You, know. you really have to include your children in that too. That's Absolutely. really important because we've had some situations yeah. that I know of where mm -hmm. the families went through the training, they took in a kid and their bio kid didn't like it and then they gave the foster kid back. Mm -hmm. So we don't want that to happen because uh, we don't want the multiple placements. We yeah. want to eliminate multiple placements. It's very damaging to the children. Every time it's another trauma. So James, is a, house. so James is a good someone, if, if I was going to be a foster parent, a resource caregiver, if I was thinking about doing that, I would gravitate to someone like James who would tell me the good and the not so good, the challenge and the support, how to navigate our world of being child welfare. Because it is an enormous task. To be a parent of your own child is enormous. So if I was to be a resource caregiver, I would ask James how, what to do, what to expect. I also have a conversation with my own child and my husband and see how it's all going to fit because when things go wrong, the last thing I want to do is fail a child and say, you have to leave. I mean, I don't, if, if I can't step it up, all of us as a family, to support a, a foster child, then I shouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. so, so to get information from people like James who've been through some tough times and to maintain connections with the birth family, that's ideal. Mm -hmm. Like what James said, he knows how his kids are doing. He knows some of his kids have gone back to the birth pens. We know that's a reality. So we prepare our foster kids when they leave us, when they age out, if they're going to go back to their birth parents, which oftentimes they do, is to equip them with the skills to know how to protect yourself. You know, you're going to go back into a home where your parents' rights were terminated because of violence and drug use or mental illness. How do you navigate that? Who do you call for help? So if James can do that, he can prepare his kids for that, that's wonderful. Because what happens is they go back to their bio families after three months, six months, a year, it doesn't work out. And they're then homeless. And our, we have a huge homeless population, yes. about 40% of our homeless teenagers on this island mm -hmm. yeah. are f former foster kids. Yeah. Because they went back to that bio family, they weren't prepared and it didn't work out for various reasons or there were still drugs or still violence. And then they left and now they're homeless. And that is a problem that we need to work on. You know, Francesca, I really like what you said earlier about you don't necessarily have to be a foster parent to have an impact on a child. I'm sure that there were other, I mean, Jackie's obviously the primary person that made that impact, but there had to be other people that really had a positive influence. Absolutely. So my, my social worker, Leonie Toscano, I, uh, she comes to mind. She really push me to go after scholarships, to follow my dreams, to apply to college. I also think about my coaches in track and field. I had some phenomenal coaches um, that helped me get to Cal and compete at Cal and even stayed with me after I went on to college. So I had a community and that's the beauty of Hawaii that I think maybe other areas of the world and even the country may not have. This is a special place. It was a community that helped raise me. The, the entire town of Kona came together for my benefit. I ran for Miss Kona Coffee. They had my back. I, in fact, I like basically sell, sold out the entire um, <laughs> uh, auditorium that we had it in. So um, when, when I wanted to do something, the community was behind me. So it, it wasn't like you said, it wasn't only Jackie. It was only the social worker that I had in, in my back pocket and in my corner. But I also had a lot of mentors along the way, a lot of phenomenal teachers at Kealakehe, Miss Lewis, um, just shouting her out because she's amazing. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, 
it takes it takes a village to yeah. raise children, yeah, especially children that come from our type of background, who have been abused, who have been homeless, who come from um, drug addicted backgrounds or mental illness backgrounds. It's going to take more than than just love to get us there. So uh, it's very important for the community to come together. And I'm thankful for Kona for having my back. James, we're going to give you the last word. We only have about 30 seconds left. We've talked a lot about the challenges, but briefly, tell us the joy of doing this kind of work. The joys are seeing the kids turn around, seeing the kids say please and thank you, uh, seeing them love you the first time they call me dad when I didn't tell them to, um, which has just recently happened with my six-year-olds. They, they, they fought over who was going to call me dad first. <laughs> yeah, so those little moments, it's when they're doing well in school, when the teachers and the community members tell me how polite or well-mannered my children are, when I don't see that at home. And it's really nice to hear it from community <laughs> members. <laughs> um, it's those little things. It, and it's just the, you know, um, the, the love that I have for them shines through them. And that's what makes it so positive. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight. We, of course, thank our guest, Francesca Weems, a former foster child and currently a senior account executive at Communications Pacific. Cynthia Goss, the assistant branch administrator with the Child Welfare Services branch at the Department of Human Services. James Bott, a resource giver or what was formerly termed a foster parent. And Tina Porras Jones, a vice president of community building programs at Parents and Children Together. Next week on Insights, Governor David Ige wants to state of Hawaii to double its local food production by the year 2020. Today, we import up to 90% of the food we consume, and many believe our local food supply would last less than a week if those cargo ships and planes stop coming. We'll have that important discussion next week right here. I'm Yanji Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii Ahui Ho.